welcome to The Hammer Factor, where we help successful athletes and professionals share their genius with the world. I'm John Grace, your host here at The Hot Seat, and now it's time to light this fire. She was raised by wolves and rides a, like, drives a pack of wild dogs around. Raised by wolves. That's pretty cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, welcome to this episode of The Hammer Factor. Very special show coming up. We have none other than Sarah McNair Landry, the first female polar master guide ever in the world. Youngest person to reach the North Pole and the youngest to reach the South Pole. And recently named European Adventure Film Festival Adventurer of the Century. Alongside Sarah, her sidekick, Eric Boomer, world-class kayaker and expeditionist himself. Welcome to the show, guys. Great to be here. What's up, John? Oh, man, just, you know, as we talked about a little bit before I started recording, juggling the daily, homeschooling, and the whole nine yards. How are you guys doing? We're doing good. We're um, up in uh, Baffin Island right now, and uh, it's uh, social distancing is pretty easy up here. We can still get outside <laughs> and ski and dog sled and... Um, so we can't complain too much compared to people stuck in the city. So now where you're at right now, is it a town, a village? Like, is it on the coast? Give me a, let's kind of set the stage of where you're at right now. Um, we're in, uh, Iqaluit, which is in Southern Baffin Island. It's the largest, uh, town on the island and it's where I grew up and there's about 7,000 people that live here. Um, but we have no roads that leave the town, so it's to get in and out, you have to fly in. Yeah, and we're right on the coast, too, so, like, literally right across the road is the beach, and the ocean is totally frozen solid, so we can just kind of cruise out, and, you know, if it's not windy, we'll cruise out and hook up the dogs and go for a dog sled or ski drawer. And if it's windy, we just kind of walk out the back door and fly a kite. And in the summer, we'll just walk out the back door and paddle. So, so what, it's a pretty sweet location. What's the temperature right now? It um, It's just turning into spring. It just got warm, so it's kind of in the minus. I talk in Celsius, so, but kind of the zero to minus 10 Celsius. So we still, it's winter, but it's. It's starting to melt slowly, the snow. Yeah, it's just below freezing. Some days it goes above. Okay, so you're starting. And so when does the ice break? Usually we can dog sled and kite till about mid-June, depending on the season, before the ice breaks up. Oh, wow. Yeah, so we got a good month, month and a half to go. <laughs> it takes a while for summer to come up there. <laughs> well, we've had Boomer on the show before, so Sarah, I'm probably going to put you a little bit more in the hot seat than Boomer during this episode. We've actually had request to have you on the show. You're one of the few people that we've actually had someone request to come on the show after we did uh, Boomer's interview. So this is going to be super exciting for me, I'm sure for some of the people who listen out there. Let's jump right into it. Tell our audience, Sarah, something that they probably don't know about you. Oh man, that's a tough one. Mm. Um, <laughs> something that people don't know about me. I mean, did you have like a Spice Girls? I heard we talk about a Spice Girls poster in your room. Was this just made up, or is this for real? <laughs> you know, that was that's a made up rumor by Boomer. <laughs> but uh, I must confess, I am that age where the Spice Girls were pretty hot when I was about ten, eleven, and uh, although I didn't have a Spice Girls poster. I did have a Backstreet Boys poster in my room. <laughs> <laughs> she didn't get the uh, dragon tattoo on her back like she wanted to when she was in seventh grade. <laughs> <laughs> Sarah, before you got into ex going to the North Pole, heading to the South Pole, I want to get into some more specific expeditions later on. What were you like as a little kid? What was little Sarah doing? you know, besides jamming out to the Backstreet Boys? Um, we, the town, when I grew up in this town, it was really small. It was only 2,000 people. And um, so a lot of our time was just spent outside camping. My parents always had a dog team. 
um, from as far back as I can remember. So in the winter, there's a lot of family camping and hunting and dog sledding. Um, and then in the summer, there's usually litters of puppies. So it was playing with puppies and raising them and taking care of the dogs. Um, but yeah, that was kind of growing up. I have an older brother, so the two of us would get dragged out on adventures and camping trips. So when you went out on adventures and camping trips, you're, I mean, it's, I'm just trying to like wrap my head around just day to day operations when it's that cold all the time. Are you, to someone who's never been in that environment, I mean, I've been in cold weather, I've been in some alpine environments, but I've never been where it's just like so cold that you really don't want your skin to touch things. And I've seen these Instagram posts where it's, you guys are like bundled up and you can barely see your eyes and whatnot. Were you, were your, was your family taking you out in conditions like that when you were a kid? You know, they'd pick and choose the weather for sure, especially when I was little. Um, and we'd do a lot more camping in the springtime when the conditions were again warmer or we'd go, you know, we had a little cabin out of town. So we'd go camp at the cabin. Um, and I had uh, I had a full set of caribou clothing, so that'd keep me nice and warm. <laughs> That's so awesome. But yeah, it's it's cold, and in the winter, you know, it's pitch black by like one one thirty. Um, and pretty much your strategy is to be fully covered. Um, even now, I mean, it's so it's nice and warm outside, but the sun is just so intense. We pretty much try to keep our face covered up. Right. Yeah, and I'm just gonna jump in and mansplain every now and then, and do a little interpretation. <laughs> Sometimes Sarah leaves some things out because she doesn't think that it's like unusual that your mom like sews entire like snow suits for you and like makes your own homemade boots that are like super super warm. And so that's like part of the thing is is uh, Sarah's mom is a really good seamstress, and so. You know, traditionally you would you would just have clothes from like caribou or seal that were really warm. You'd bundle kids up in, um, but you know Sarah's mom would kind of make her own styles, and sometimes it was was caribou or whatnot. But everything we're wearing is is pretty much homemade for the colder temperatures, and and there's like little kid suits still floating around here that Sarah's mom would make. So you have to have a mom who's a really good sewer to go out in the cold when you're a kid, really. I can't even imagine that. And so when is everybody using a dog sled to get around? Are people is I mean, obviously there's gotta be people snowmobiling. How's everybody getting around up there in the winter? In town there's roads that they keep pretty plowed so you can drive around town or it's pretty small so you can walk. But definitely if you want to get out of town, I would say most people travel by snow machine is just a little easier than a dog team. Um, there, there are a big crew of us that have dog teams, but, uh, you have to love it. It's so much work. There's a, I think everybody thinks of dog sled as this romantic image that, (laughs) you know, you just like (laughs) dogs are galloping through the snow and it's beautiful. And like, to be honest, I just spend most of my time shoveling dog shit. (laughs) (laughs) It's not like a snow machine in summertime. We can't just like park it and not think about it for a couple months. Like it's there, you know, they always need to be exercised and fed and loved and taken care of and trained. And um, so it's, it's definitely a commitment. How many dogs do you have? Right now we have uh, 13 dogs and um, hopefully one pregnant dog. Okay. And so how many dogs do you actually team up and, and, and use to pull? It it varies depending on what we want to do. Um, I've done expeditions with as little as eight dogs on a team. Um, up to uh, when Boomer and I went around Baffin Island, we had 16 dogs on our team. Um, so it really varies, but I, I like a team between 10 10 to 14 is a pretty good size. And what kind of dogs are these? Are they classic Malamutes? I mean, that's what in my head what I'm seeing. But They're, um, they're Canadian Inuit dogs. So it's the same dogs that Inuit brought with them when they migrated across the Bering Strait. Um, 
and pretty similar to the dogs they use in Greenland too. They're, um, yeah, they're big, they're stocky, they're big, they're very different than like what you'd see people run the Iditarod with, which are like very lanky, fast little dogs. Okay. These guys are pretty. A little more squatty than the Malamute. Yeah. More like a Malamute mixed with like an Akita or a Chow or something. Okay. And how much does a dog, like a typical boy dog weigh? Probably 70 pounds, maybe 100 for the big guys, but um, they're definitely like endurance dogs. They're not the fastest, but they they just like put their heads down and can truck for days and days and days. It's pretty incredible. And they it, love it. It is incredible. That's on, actually on my bucket list of things to do is to do a dog dog sled trip. Can I talk about the dogs yeah. real quick? Can we can we talk about them? Like yeah, how, of course. How old? I mean, what's their career like? A dog? Like, what happens to it when it's a little puppy? How do you know if it's going to be a good dog? And then when do they retire? How does it work for a dog's career? Uh, so we try to most of the dogs on our team we raise ourselves, um, just because you know then we can train them from puppies and they get. Uh, they get to know the other dogs on the team um, when they're little. So we'll bring on, depends how many we need, but two to four puppies um, generally. And when they're when they're young, the most important thing is just really socializing them so they're friendly. They learn how to come. They learn how to sit. Um, you know, it's pretty fun. We just bring them for walks and play with them. And, um, and then... They'll start to pull six months. We can start to harness them up usually. Um, I wouldn't say they're really adding to the team till they're over a year old. Um, and there's, you know, they're still kind of in training. We have our youngest dogs right now are a year and a half and they're still very, very puppyish. They forget all the time <laughs> <laughs> that they need to sit down and behave and you can't always play. Um, it's cool to see them. They actually learn from the older dogs really well and really quick too. Like if if you if you didn't have an older team that you were bringing them into, it would it would be a nightmare. But with the the older ones, they kind of teach them somehow. I always have this vision in my head of like this one lead dog, and it's always out front. Is it is it like that when you like? strap them to the sled or do you rotate them around or how does that work right now we have uh two lead dogs up there they're uh they like they like each other they're good friends so they both kind of tag team the lead um but they're starting to get a bit older so we're we're starting to train some newer lead dogs um which there's moments where they seem amazing and there's moments where (laughs) We're definitely not going the right way. <laughs> they just won't go the right direction? Like, what What does that mean? Yeah, you know, that's the thing with a dog team. It's not like any other sport where you just progressively get better. Um, you know, you'll have an amazing dog team, and then all of a sudden your lead dog will retire, and you're kind of starting from ground zero again. Uh, interesting. Uh, On the dog side thing, we could circle back around to this too, but right now our COVID project, which is going to – is kind of a bigger long burn project. We don't have, to, we have a few things we could point you to, but um, we did a, we did some filming four or five years ago when we did a 120 day dog sled trip around the island through winter, kind of retracing Sarah's parents' trip. And right now we're putting together a film for it. So we've been going back and shooting B reel and. And um, the film's looking really, really solid. I think it's going to be a pretty good, pretty big contender at the the Outdoor Film Fest and hopefully outside of the, the Outdoor Film Fest as well, too. Was that the trip you did in 2015? Yeah. yeah. Okay, I think I was reading something about that. We'll, we'll definitely have to get into that um, here in a little bit. Sarah, at, at what point did you did you decide, you know, I want to go on these expeditions beyond just an enthusiast more of a as a professional when when did you make that decision you know it was it was pretty slow I don't remember like a specific day where I'm like this is what I want to do um I 
it just slowly, gradually built, you know, as I got older, um, my brother and I started doing longer and longer trips and we'd go out for a week or go out for two weeks. Uh, my parents are both, um, guides and own, um, a guiding company. So oftentimes we'd jump on and help them, um, help them on trips, whether it was hiking trips or dog sled trips. And, um, I would say my first real expedition was uh, my parents pulled uh, my brother and I out of school. I think I was 16, and uh, we spent a month crossing the Greenland ice cap. Wow. And I would say that was for sure kind of my intro to all of this. We had dogs, we had kites, we were skiing. Um, so it was a bit of a combination of everything that I've continued to do on that trip. And, um, you know, dogs were something I'd grown up with, so I just knew forever. But kites back then were super new. People weren't really kite skiing. It wasn't really a sport. Um, and I remember we learned how to kite like a year or two before that trip. And then we bought the kites kind of just to try them out to see how it worked. And, um, yeah, it was super eye-opening on that trip of just like, wow, we can make such – huge miles with these kites yeah you're hauling ass what yeah <laughs> like all that people you know were too long to do or too hard to do just cross-country skiing if you had good winds and good conditions it was like easy what do you do if you're on a trip like that and the wind shifts <laughs> <laughs> you know kiting and when i said easy it's not Everybody does have this image that it's easy because you just hold on to a kite. But if we're going to go do a kite expedition, we're going to cover some serious distance. So it's it's a lot of work, and we're putting in huge, huge days. Um, so our strategy is kind of like kite when the winds blow and then sleep when there are no winds. Um, and that means sometimes we're kiting like 20 hours a day, and then if there's no wind the next day, you sleep as much as you can and kind of – get ready for the next blow but um it's really it's really psychological <laughs> kite expeditions because you can cover like 200 kilometers one day and you're just like yeah we're gonna make it no problem we're gonna get there early and then you get stuck with three days of wind where you're covering hardly anything oh, God. and it's like oh man we're never gonna make it we're stuck in a tent <laughs> Who would you say, I mean, you said your family got you into this and were guiding. Was 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 there any single person that was more of a mentor to you through this transition of, of becoming a professional in this? I had a couple different mentors, for sure. My parents, um, they, you know, I watched them start this guiding company um, up in Baffin Island and they started doing day trips and week trips and uh, when I was 12, my mom led the first ever expedition to the North Pole, and they continued to lead expeditions to the North and South Pole and kind of pioneered the whole polar guiding scene. Um, so for sure, you know, they taught me everything I know um, about polar expeditions. I was also really lucky to, uh, I don't know, have you heard of Will Steger? I have not. Um, He's uh he's American and he's kind of a legend in the polar world. He's done some uh huge trips and uh he's very much like a John Turk style guy. I uh <laughs> definitely a character and just like loves being outside and he's you know, Will Steger's like seventy and he's still going and doing like solo exhibitions in the Northwest Territories. Um it's super inspiring. But, uh, you know, he did a 210-day dog sled trip in Antarctica. And uh, I was pretty lucky that I met him and uh, worked for him for a year. And we did two two big expeditions together um, up on Ellesmere Island and, and uh, in Greenland. Um, and, uh, yeah, he was super inspiring to work with just how he made a career out of it and had just kept doing it you know like yeah. his whole life and at 70 uh, yeah yeah so did i hear you correctly that you went to the north pole when you were 12 no uh sorry my mom led the first expedition to the north pole when i was 12 ah okay i got gotcha. you 
So then when did you, when was your first major expedition that just you were taking on planning? You kind of, you kind of took it on as your own, own thing. Um, so I got to go to the, I was 18 when I did, uh, the South pole and then 19 when I did the North pole. Um, but those were always with teams and, you know, they're big projects. Um, I would say the first expedition that my brother and I really did everything, all the planning, all the fundraising, um, was we did a south to north kite skiing uh, traverse of the Greenland ice cap. Where did you start and where did you finish this trip? We pretty much started at the tip of Greenland, um, the small little community, and then we kited uh, northwest and ended in the in Kanak, which is one of the furthest north communities. Um, so about 2,300 kilometers, but just amazing, amazing winds that just roll off the ice cap, which makes it super predictable. We were able to cover 420 kilometers one day. Wow. That is amazing. And so you're strapped in the saddle that whole time for that whole distance. Yeah, we would, you know, we'd stop every two hours, eat and drink and check navigation, make sure we're going the right way. And uh, as the wind shift, we would stop and change kites and put up different kites. Um, but yeah, we did a 24 hour push. We kind of wanted to see how far we could go in a 24 hour push and uh, cover just over 400. That is amazing. I had no idea that you could go that far on a kite. Well, I guess if you got 24 hours of daylight, that kind of changes things a little bit, but God dang, that is a long way. Holy moly. That just kind of blows the dog sled away. <laughs> <laughs> but then the next day there'll be like no wind and you'll do zero. <laughs> True. Good point. What's been your favorite expedition, Sarah, of all of these places that you've been? I don't know if I have a favorite. Um, there's a couple that are special. My brother and I, kite skied through the Northwest Passage, um, which definitely there's moments that were terrible, but we had a lot of great memories from it. Um, and I think, I think it, there was kind of the shift. Traditionally polar expeditions are very, um, ice cap, Arctic ocean driven. Right. Um, there's kind of like the checklist, like the seven summits, you know, like everybody wants to climb, the seven tallest summits mm -hmm. and I kind of feel like in polar expeditions, everybody wants to do uh, the standard East to West Greenland ice cap crossing, the North pole, the South pole. And I feel pretty lucky to have, I'm glad I did them. They're amazing expeditions, but I feel pretty lucky to have kind of checked them off my list right away. Right. <laughs> and then there's just no pressure to do them. And, and, we just discovered all these other really cool exhibitions that one I'm awful at getting sponsors and fundraising. So, you know, kite skiing the no through the Northwest passage, we're able to do it really cheap on a budget, um, compared to like going down to Antarctica. Um, and, and yeah, there's just ice caps are beautiful, but it, they're very dead. There's nothing that lives up there. There's no people. There's no culture. Um, so that Northwest Passage trip, and then since then, um, we've done some dog sledding and kayaking trips. And, um, yeah, it just it's cool to go through areas with wildlife and mountains and different changing terrain. And um, on the Northwest Passage, we traveled through Inuit towns and got to visit them and um, I don't know it just adds so much more to an expedition than just being on an ice cap where every direction you look is white All right for days and days and days no that makes sense when you when you are on one of these expeditions and you run into an Inuit village what's their response I mean is it like they're seeing a ghost they're like what where did you come from or are they just I mean how does that interaction work it's my favorite way to travel into these communities is with a dog sled. Um, cause you just like, you know, people are so connected to the land and to their culture that y there's like this immediate connection. Um, 
and it usually happens over maps. <laughs> you know, you start pulling out maps and talking about roots and then just like the, all these stories come out of their, you know, where they hunt or where they're born or where they grew up. Yeah, and it's pretty incredible because the, you know, the Inuit were living hunter-gatherer, you know, in like the 50s, there were still people being born in igloos and like literally living with just like in the, the harshest environment with a knife, a couple dogs and like a dog sled and, you know, they would be able to build their home as they travel, hunt, get the fat, make make fire, like a, a heating source with the fat. And so these these like really amazing people that just look at the world different than anyone I've ever met still are out there and when you travel by traditional means you've got an instant like connection with them or meeting them on the land and it's it's just it's it's kind of the craziest cultural experience I've ever had and and most awesome it's just kind of like being in another another planet it's kind of like a couple of rednecks comparing pickup trucks (laughs) (laughs) yeah but you know what I mean when you have that like bomb all of a sudden it just like opens up like yeah, <laughs> yeah. no no for sure <laughs> for sure there's got to be some good examples of how it's yeah like like some of the folks in north carolina and tennessee that you meet on the way to some of the creek put-ins and whatnot <laughs> uh, i'm just picturing you guys rolling into like you know an inuit village and the guys coming out and checking out your sled and kicking the you know, <laughs> kicking the side of it, and you're like, "Yeah, it's like, oh yeah, sure, you know. <laughs> <For> sure, <laughs> yeah." <laughs> well, that was the first thing they'd always check out was the sled because every community kind of has its own like terrain that the sleds are built for. So some communities have a lot more rough ice to deal with, so the nose is curved up a lot more, and others it's just flat ocean ice, and others it's more hills and mountain lands so each sled design is kind of custom for that terrain so that that was actually a big topic (laughs) along the whole way was the the sled what about the hunting sarah what are you hunting for and is is that a big part of sustaining yourself on some of these big trips or are you is that just kind of a backup thing you know when um most of the expeditions are ice caps where you know it's dead there is nothing up there um, the, the expeditions we do in, um, Northern Canada, for sure there's hunting potential. Um, but it's, it's really tough to like merge kind of that expedition mentality with, with stopping and hunting. And, uh, one, I'm not a good hunter at all. Um, Boomer is way more successful <laughs> than I've ever been. Um. But yeah, like on the on the dog sled trip when we went around Baffin Island, we we always carry a gun because we need one for polar bears. Um, and we had we were had planned on hunting if we saw animals, um, both for ourselves and for the dogs. But we just, you know, the chance that there's like an animal on your path, <laughs> right, right, <laughs> right there, and it just we were pushing so hard. We were putting 12 hours in a day by the last two months trying to do 50 kilometers a day that we just didn't have time to veer off and to go hunt when we got into camp. Right. Yeah. Um, You were just ready to hunker down and get to the next day. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we, we just would have needed that time to like deviate off the path to go to a place where maybe there's better hunting or more wildlife and um and it just didn't it didn't really work out i would say the the trip we did a sea kayaking trip across baffin island um following these old traditional portage routes um and we did a lot of fishing on that trip and boomer shot a couple geese and ptarmigan we shot a couple ptarmigan and birds Uh, that's my favorite is the small game because it's like it's it would be hard for me to we're always traveling so if you got like a caribou or a seal or or like that it's just more than you'd be able to eat or to carry with you for so long so yeah i kind of like the small game rabbits geese ducks we got some ducks 
What about yeah. the polar bears? What? Tell me about some inner. Are you? Do you have a good relationship with them? Do they? You know? How does that work? <laughs> they scare the crap out of me. Anytime I think about going up there, I've had a couple close bear encounters in Alaska, and the bears weren't even worried about me, but it still scared me to no end. <laughs> with the polar bears or grizzlies? Grizzlies. Grizzlies are kind of grumpy. They scare me too. Yeah, these bears, they were just fishing and they really could have cared less. I was kind of just in their way. You know, they would just stroll right through camp, you know, like a, a mom with three cubs just strolled literally right through our camp. It just really <laughs> blew me away because we were just sitting there having breakfast. But I know that polar bears have a whole different kind of thing. Correct me if I'm wrong, but they're kind of thinking you could be food. Oh, yeah, for sure. They're they're pretty curious, too. Um, and uh, they kind of have that same attitude. Like, they're just top of the food chain, so nothing really scares them much. And uh, they'll wander right in camp. And um, it's generally it's pretty easy right away to tell if it's a curious bear just kind of checking you out. And, or if it's a hungry bear. But the scary thing is when um, when they come at night and you're sleeping because they can get pretty close before you even realize there's a bear outside. How do you deal with that? And you've got a story you need to tell. You've got a story too. Well, I could tell my I could tell mine first, and then Sarah can finish <laughs> hers because I want to hear mine, some stories. Think, so my polar bear stories at a bunch of close encounters on Ellesmere Island. Uh, on the 100 day trip with John Turk. Uh, every bear that we saw, you know, you can tell from their body language, they're curious, they're curious. And then you've just, you know, got to yell, hey, fuck you, bear, and, and uh, <laughs> scare them. And then they go away. But there was, uh, there was one camp. We just raided some food cache that was at like a, some northern point, and there was like a can of, smoked salmon john john grabbed so he, he was eating the smoked salmon and uh we went to bed and i guess that can of smoked salmon was still sitting in the vestibule of the tent oh and it's like we, a jurassic park scene yeah oh. we, we had the uh, luckily we, we had the gun kind of in the tent because we had seen bears during the day but woke up at about two or three in the morning and this bear had kind of gotten his head inside the out the outer door and was pawing and and rip ripped the inner vestibule door of our tent a little bit and so i was just kind of nose to nose with him screaming at him and he backed up and uh so i stood up through the tent just in my long underwear with the gun kind of following him out and there were four other bears around our oh. tent checking out <laughs> point and i was freaked out so i i had to yell and scream and i had a couple bear bangers in the, the gun so eventually i was able to you know through through yelling at them they really pick up on your energy so you just you just have to say the the meanest shit that you can think of and tell them you know you're just telling them like hey look dude i know i'm small but like i might be able to kill you i have this gun and i will kill you i'm not kidding like I'm going to hurt you. Sure. You can, you're tougher than I am, but I will hurt you. You kind of have and, to feel like, you know, those like dappy dogs that come at you at your ankles and really scare you. Yeah. Like, yeah, uh, yeah you kind of have to be like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and so these bears kind of start moseying off and walk far enough that I can't see them past the hill or whatever. And I sit back into the tent and, John and I, John's like pretty groggy still from sleeping because we were woken up in the middle of the night, the the 24 hour night of the Arctic. And John was just like, whoa, well, that was exciting. And I guess I'm going to go back to bed and just kind of yawn and put his his uh, his eye cover back on and started going to bed. <laughs> that was it. And uh I didn't go back to bed. I, I stayed up. I woke him up a little bit early to travel that, that morning, actually. <laughs> so did you just, like, get out and start, like, shooting the gun in the air and just yelling, screaming, stomping until they left? Yeah, totally. Just, like, you know, just basically said, like, hey, guys, you're in our space. 
you know, give us some room <laughs> with, with, with some gun firing, some more swear words, calling their mom names. And, uh... and yeah, they back up a little bit because, you know, they are the top of the top of the food chain, but the life is pretty damn hard out there. So they can't really afford to get injured. So more than, you know, you, you just want to be that thing that could cause them some kind of injury that is going to affect their hunting. So you, you, you know, you just let them know, like, you don't know what to think of me, man. You know, like I'm, I am crazy. <laughs> and, uh, you, you know, but those bears, they were definitely in the curious stage, you know, and, and, and when you watch them moving, you can tell they're, they're trying to decide. They're like, man, is this guy a threat? Like, what is this? Or is he food? And I think when they decide like, oh yeah, this is food. This is something I want. Then they go into straight predator mode, and and that's not something you want. And I think in Sarah's story, I think they had a bear that decided they were food. So that that story is a little bit more scary for me. Let's hear it. Um, so it was like halfway through our Northwest Passage trip, and um, with my brother, we had we were probably forty days in. And we just got to this section. We knew the ice was really bad. Um, what, what's that mean, the ice got, is bad? There's strong currents, and it breaks up often, okay. so it can cause thin ice and sketchy ice. And, um, it's kind of like, an, like a current of broken, shitty ice that like you're jumping from little piece to piece, and it's like yeah. maybe big enough to support you, but maybe not, and it's flowing at like seven or eight miles an hour. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay, that's a good visual. Got it. Yeah, yeah, really bad. Um, but we got there. I remember we got there and we like hiked up on this hill and looked out, and it was pretty uncrossable. Um, and I was, I didn't quite want to admit it that we couldn't cross yet. So we were like, oh, let's just camp here and let's check it again in the morning and see if anything's changed. Um, you know, our option if we couldn't cross the ice was to do a 550 kilometer detour around this sketchy ice. So it wasn't like a great plan B. Um, so we we set up our camp, um, went to sleep. Um, we didn't. We knew it was like a bad polar bear area. Generally, anytime you see open water, there's gonna be bears because bears. Um, feed off the seals so they're just patrolling the big cracks and the open water and the ice um right. kind of as a rule of thumb if there's open water there'll be most likely bears and um we had this little tripwire fence that we set up around the tent and the idea is that if a bear did come into camp it would uh trigger the tripwire which, which would trigger a flare and set this flare up hopefully scaring the bear but also waking us up so we can do something about it and uh yeah we went to sleep again it was late in the season by now so it was almost 24 hours of sunlight and uh so it was light when the bear came in he uh walked all around camp his tracks were everywhere to our sleds to our tent he circled us multiple times <laughs> of course we were like sound asleep and uh Somehow we got over a tripwire fence and I woke up like seconds before he started jumping on our tent. What? Um, and he came down on my side of the tent, kind of landing on me and on the vestibule. Um, and first thing I did was just, I started screaming. I started kicking the side of the tent where he was kind of coming down on. And it was just enough to like, that he backed up back into our fence and, and pulled one of the flares. Um, so by the time, you know, I opened the door, the, the scariest place to be is in the tent because you can't see what's happening. So immediately I opened the door um, and I could see the bear was like kind of tangled in her fence a couple yards back. And um, my brother jumped out of his sleeping bag, ran outside, grabbed the shovel on the way out. And I followed um, and ran outside. We couldn't find any of our bear flares because when the bear jumped on the tent, like everything kind of flew everywhere. Um, 
And, you know, we're, like, standing outside in our socks. My brother can't find his glasses, and he's pretty much blind without his glasses. Oh. <laughs> um, anyway, I made the split decision. The bear was still a couple y- yards back, so I was like, I'm going to go grab the gun, which was in the other vestibule. So I run around to the other door of the tent, jump in, start getting the gun out of the case. Um, meanwhile, the bear uh, charges my brother, and... Uh, my brother smacked the bear across the face with his like two foot camp shovel. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. It was not even like in the extended mode. <laughs> oh my God. And how big of a bear are we talking here? He, I mean, a polar bear. Like he was, a, I'm pretty sure it was a young male polar bear. Um, and, uh, yeah. So I, I can't see what's happening. I'm in the vestibule trying to get the gun out, but I can just hear my brother swearing. He's like, get that fucking gun out now. (laughs) And is he like stand like they're like having a face off here? Yeah. So he like hit the bear and the bear kind of stopped. And then the bear would like take a couple steps towards him. And then he'd like take a couple Uh, steps back. I'm like trying to keep the shovel between them. When he describes this story, he makes it like sound like he's like kind of like laid, like almost sat down in the bears. Like, kind of cowering over him just like <laughs> oh. it's terrifying and he kind of like inches his way back to the to the bear fence like this other corner that still had a flare on it and he so he grabbed the flare and like pulled it and kind of pointed it right in the bear's face and when the flare's engaged it just kind of shoots like fire out um Anyway, so he he gets this flare and points it to the bear, and it's enough to scare the bear off, and the bear loops around pretty much to where I am. And by now, I'm, like, coming out of the tent with the gun. And uh, I knew we only had two bullets in the gun um, that were loaded. And, uh, yeah, there's, like, this moment where there's, like, this decision to make, you know, what to do. Um, and I took the chance and I fired like a couple feet above his head. Um, and luckily like the sound was just enough that he slowly wandered off <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> and, and then he climbed up on an ice chunk and by then I, I had the bullet. So I felt good about shooting, shooting again. And I shot another one off in the air and then he kind of kept slowly wandering off and disappeared into the ice. Um, and then that day, we uh, we made the decision. We couldn't go back to bed, so we sewed up our tent. <laughs> yeah, I <day>. said so. <laughs> yeah. And then we we hiked up the hill to go scout the ice, and pretty much as we were making the decision to do the 550 kilometer detour, we looked back, and there was another bear at our tent. <laughs> so we came running back down scared him off and then we saw three more bears later that day um oh. yeah it took us about it took us a good week before we were really able to to sleep at night so did you have to do the the go around or could you cross we uh did the detour oh man yeah low point we could say that much <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty epic so were you with dogs on this trip? No, we were only kite skiing. Okay. Um, and we just had skiing. kites and cross country skis, and that's that's a scary thing when you're traveling in the Arctic. Like the story on the kite skiing expedition and Boomer's story on the kayaking expedition, um, you have no warning system. Like even if the fence had gone off, he's still like two meters from our tent by the time you're woken up. Right. Um, as traveling with dogs, they they bark anytime a bear comes into the camp. Um, so I feel way safer traveling with a team of dogs or even one dog in polar bear areas because um, they'll bark and warn you that the bear is coming in. Right. Are the bears scared of a team of dogs? Yeah, at times for sure. And a lot of times we'll leave a dog or two loose at night. Um, and sometimes they'll kind of chase the bear out of camp. Right. Woo! Man, that was gripping. Let me... You feel like, do you want to come visit us now? Yeah, come dog sled. 
I mean, I do want to. I it's definitely unnerving. I would be one of those people who's literally sleeping with the gun. You know what I mean? It would be I mean, I'm sure I would probably get a little used to it over time, but I would be definitely Yeah, you could do that in the summertime, but in the winter the moisture would freeze the gun, so you have to actually keep it like outside. outside. Yeah. <laughs> oh god. It just gets better. It just gets just gets more glorious. Yeah, the moisture is probably the biggest issue in the in the extreme cold. Like even if you're if you're taking a picture or filming, you have to just get used to holding your breath every time you put your face up to the camera. Otherwise, it just like your your warm moist breath will instantly just cover your camera with with a layer of ice, and you know it'll be hard to see through the eye finder. That's a whole new element trying to work in those conditions. Yeah. What about Sarah? What's been your lowest moment on all of these expeditions? Well, I mean, that story is a pretty low moment. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I would say that was, that that that's up there. Um, Breaking your back in Greenland wasn't exactly a high point. Yeah. Yeah, Boomer, Boomer and I and uh, Ben Stukesbury did a expedition in Greenland, and uh, the idea was to spend 30 days kite skiing across the ice cap, um, towing all our kayaking gear to to get to the source of this really cool river that uh, Stukesbury and Boomer found on Google Google Maps, um, and. Uh, yeah, day seven of the trip, um, my safety system on my kite failed and uh, it picked me up in the air and landed me pretty hard on my head. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but I ended up uh, fracturing a vertebrae. On day seven of your trip? Day seven, yeah. Give me a little detail about this kite crash. So your safety system, so the kite went just basically full power on you? Yeah, you know, as the winds were picking up really quick, and um, like looking back at it, that's one of those times where I felt like I did everything right, and it was just um, really bad luck. Um, but the winds just picked up. I could see Ben was struggling with some with his kite, and I was gonna go over and help. And it got to a point where I was like, man, I can't even handle my own kite. Maybe I'll just like put it down, roll it up, take care of myself, and then walk over and go help Ben and um yeah I mean I had my kite down my skis off and I was just um when you when it's really windy you can't really anchor your kite on the ice cap because it's just flapping everywhere so you can't really roll it up so I just there's a safety system that you pull and it completely releases all the power of the kite um so I pulled it to be able to roll up my kite and uh it uh instead of engaging it it caught and it basically made the situation way worse. It fully powered up my kite, but once your safety is pulled, you have no control. You can't steer it anymore. Um, so yeah, it fully powered up my kite and picked me up. I was clipped to my sled and my, and my kayak and it picked them up too. Um, and then, uh, yeah, it pretty much dropped me on my head. Um, and, uh, Looking at back at it, I was out. Luckily, um, somebody was out, able to grab my kite, um, but I was knocked out for a little bit. And then, uh, yeah, after the adrenaline kind of passed, I got myself back to the tent, and um, it was pretty obvious that something was wrong with my back. Um, I, I think I broke a couple ribs too, um, but I mean, trying to diagnose anything in a tent. <laughs> is uh pretty impossible and yeah i knew it was i knew it was fucked up and <laughs> she wouldn't she wouldn't listen to me or ben or whatever she was pretty much in on the trip a hundred percent she didn't want to want to go home at all couldn't convince her not to and yes yeah, so it turned out to be a pretty legit break it was like a 40 percent compression fracture of t8 so it's the kind of thing that like yeah, like when it's like a lumbar 40% compression, it's like, you know, it puts you out for a while. So, so what, did, usually... 
So what did going. you do after that? Did they strap you to a sled, Sarah? I mean, could you continue to kite? What What were the actions after that? You know, we were still moving through the crevasse field, um, and it was actually our first day on kites. We just spent seven days like hauling our gear through the crevasse field, so we couldn't kite because because of all the crevasses. And um, we there was no winds. We had a lot of <laughs> group talks between the three of us. I bet you and, did. <laughs> <laughs> you know what the right decision was, whether I should stay, whether I should go. Um, and we kind of came up with this like five day plan that. Um, if I wasn't better in five days, then we'd have like a serious discussion about me leaving. Um, and we, we traveled every day. We never took any rest days, but what we did is, um, uh, the first couple days, there's no wind. So, uh, Ben and Boomer hauled my gear and I just skied without a sled. Um, and then the winds picked up and, I was able, it was a pretty slow kite day, so they were able to kite, and uh, I was able to just ski beside. You know, we're only doing, like, a couple kilometers a day. Um, (laughs) We weren't moving fast. The conditions were pretty awful. Um, And then by the fifth day, the winds picked up um, the wrong direction, but it just, like, allowed me to put up a a kite in camp and just kind of kite around camp without sleds. And, uh, to be honest, kiting felt way better than anything else. Um, you, the tent was rough, like sitting in a small tent. Um, so it was, it was nice to like get outside and travel every day. And, um, luckily I felt comfortable enough on the kite that I could, yeah, I could fly it and not feel super scared and, um, yeah. So to recap, you broke your back on the fifth day of this trip, and how many more days did you continue on to the other side? Uh, it was day seven. I broke my back, and we had it was forty-five days. And did your back get better, or were you just like taking ibuprofen and dealing with it? Oh yeah, I was. I was on painkillers the whole time. It definitely got better as the kite skiing went on, for sure. Um, I wouldn't say it ever got like fixed (laughs) 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 um the you know of course like once we hit the river um um portaging way more than ben and boomer portaging and that was pretty rough on my back too oh i bet the kayaking was horrible with a broken broken back (laughs) (laughs) She was still like hoping that there'd be a little waterfall she could run. And in hindsight, I'm so glad we didn't find some 10 foot <laughs> waterfall to send her broken back over. Oh, <laughs> God, you guys. <laughs> Boomer. But what you know it? what? Boomer's like, Boomer and I have like this really sweet system to move down the river um, where he'll just like run my, run my boat down. A lot of the drops, he just like ran twice. And he would run it in his boat and then hike back up and then run at my boat. And uh, same thing, you know, there's definitely a lot of portaging, but there's this big class five section in this canyon. And uh, yeah, he would like, I would start hiking down, either like take pictures or set safety. And then Boomer would run his boat and then hike back up. We'd kind of high five on the side of the river and you grab my boat and like paddle it down. That, that's, how it is when, down. that's how it is when I so. kayak with Boomer too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is yeah. so burly. I'm so glad that you're okay. Boomer, were you and Ben ever off to the side being like, all right, we're going to have to drug her and get her out of here. What were you guys thinking? <laughs> yeah, there was, there was a point definitely where – like first we had one of those off the side talks and it was just like yeah dude i don't know like i've seen her hurt but i've never seen her hurt this bad i don't think i don't know what what we're gonna do but it was off to the side because sarah wouldn't want to like hear anything about her not being there (laughs) and then uh yeah and then at some point like we brought it up and sarah just kept saying well what do you guys want to do you want me to leave don't you (laughs) you know and uh 
after that talk, you know, Ben was like, you know, what it, you know, like, is this responsible? And I was like, well, you know, Ben, if it's just you and let's just say if she comes, it's going to make the trip a little bit nicer for us. It's going to, it's going to be better if she's here. Trust me, dude. You know, like if it, if it was Ben and I, it just wouldn't quite be the, the, the same way. It would, it would have been some undue suffering, some, some extra undue suffering. So he, uh, that, that kind of helped him come along with the idea. And, and he agreed totally by the end of it. You know, it just goes a long ways having that experience of somebody who's who's done that type of a trip, you know, because it was very, very different for Ben and I to to kite ski such a long distance and to be kind of so out there and still, you know, hundreds of miles away from, from where you want to go and shit's not going right. And, right. Um, you right. have to have a real long, long, long view on that one. Yeah, you guys were Sarah, rookies yeah. at that part of the game. Yeah. Hmm. Sarah, what advice would you give to a young guy or a young girl who wants to go down the path of taking on these expeditions and jumping into your shoes? For me, it's just like taking like one step after the other and eventually you're just there. You know, it's like how we all learn sports. We It's the same thing with kayaking, like you learn how to roll and then you learn how to paddle class one and then class two and then class three and then class four. Um, nobody just like jumps into class five. Um, which is funny because in the exhibition world, a lot of times you'll see it. People with no experience will be like, I want to do this never be done before done trip before. <laughs> and it's like, man, why don't you go like camp in your backyard and like <laughs> figure out how to use your stove and set up your tent. And then, Maybe you go for a week long trip and then, you know, up, bump it up to like a two week trip or a two week trip in a slightly colder, more remote location. And uh, just like slowly keep like upping the bar once you feel comfortable. Um, which, yeah, I'd say that's that's my best advice. And, and training trips is so huge. Um, just even though I've done tons of expeditions before a big expedition, we still go out there and, you know, kind of do a shakedown trip where we like run through all the gear and make sure we haven't forgotten everything and just refresh. Um, you know, before we went to, to Greenland, Ben came up to Baffin Island for two weeks in March and March is cold up here. <laughs> and, you know, the three of us just like were outside every day, kite skiing, pulling kayaks around, seeing how they did on the snow, figuring out how much gear we can load in them. Um, like that stuff is just so important. All the details you can figure out beforehand. What about uh, what about this trip to the pole of inaccessibility? Now, what what is that? What does that mean? The pole of inaccessibility is. <laughs> Basically the most inaccessible. <laughs> Boomer's laughing because he's trying to sneak out. I was going to go cook a little rump roast, but Sarah's like, you sit here. <laughs> You're part of this too? Oh, yeah. <laughs> you can leave, Boomer. You're excused. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, John. <laughs> what is the pull of inaccessibility, Boomer? Uh, it is the most inaccessible point on the continent of Antarctica. And the, the South Pole is is not centered in the continent. So it's actually pretty short from the coast. Was it like 700 miles or something? And the Pole of Inaccessibility... I think in kilometers. ...was like 1,500 miles. I have a map of Antarctica here. And I'm looking at it. And I can see where the South Pole is. Um, definitely near the Ross Ice Shelf kind of it doesn't look like it's near the middle and so this big white more east antarctica area is that where the pole of inaccessibility is yeah it's pretty much smack in the middle of the continent and and so how did this expedition happen um it was um it was a guided trip so boomer and i were both guides um with a single client and it was her dream to ski to the pole of inaccessibility so she'd been training for five years, and uh, she skied at the South Pole two years ago, 
as a training for this trip. Um, and yeah, it was, it was just kind of her dream to, to get to the pole. It's, um, the first people to ever get to the pole of inaccessibility, of course, were the Russians with this big, uh, tractor convoy, basically. Um, they went up there for the international polio year, um, sometime in the fifties, I believe, uh, for science. And they left a small cabin with a statue, a bust of Lenin on top. Okay. <laughs> um, and then since then, there's only been a handful of expeditions. Uh, my dad actually was the first um, expedition since the Russians, and they kite skied there. Um, and then. And when was my, that? Sorry? When was that? It was, you know, in the last 10 years probably. Okay, so not long um, ago. And my brother did an expedition kite skiing there, and then several other people have kite skied there. Um, but it's it's pretty out there, and um, nobody had ever skied there, partly because it's just so far away <laughs> that using kites makes more sense. Um, but our client, uh, didn't know how to kite and wasn't really interested in learning to kite. Um, so she wanted to ski. Um, so it took us, uh, 78 days to get there from the coast. And where did you start? We started from a Russian base, a Russian scientific base that's on the coast of Antarctica. So we flew down from South Africa. And then um, the first 10 days was absolutely stunning. We skied through Queen Maud Land, which if you've ever seen um, climbing pictures in Antarctica, it's that zone. Just these like huge cliffs that come right out of the glacier. Um, so we skied through this big mountain range. We climbed up onto the plateau. And then the next 70 days were just pretty much white in every direction. <laughs> I saw some pictures on Boomer's Instagram feed, and it definitely, yeah. <laughs> just from the post, it looked like it kind of drug on a little bit in that phase. Oh, yeah. it was, And we were continually climbing the whole time. So it was like uphill the whole way, <laughs> white in every direction. And we were at altitude, um, which we could definitely feel it um, for – and being at altitude for that long was definitely gets old <laughs> for sure. Um, but yeah, the first, the first other thing we saw apart from like white in every direction was um, about two kilometers away from the pull of inaccessibility. Um, we saw a little black dot on the horizon and uh, the cabin, the Russians left is fully under the snow, but um the bust of Lenin is uh, still sticking out. <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> I know. So you get you get to the most inaccessible place in Antarctica, and there's like the statue of Lenin. <laughs> That's so Russian too. I I spent three months yeah. in Russia, and that is so Russian. <laughs> so how many days total did it take this trip? Seventy eight days, and we took two rest days in that. So uh, most of it was, you know, pretty much outside skiing day after day. Was your client in better shape than you guys? We were in really good shape coming into it. And, um, you know, she had definitely trained hard, but it was a really, it was a, it was a tough trip for her. And uh, um, especially with the altitude, um, which, I mean, she did she did great. It, it was a tough trip for anybody. <laughs> right, right. Um, I think the reason nobody's, nobody skied to the pull of inaccessibility yet. Um, and, you know, it's just, it's it's very different than the dog sledding and the kite skiing, which are very like dynamic and um, stuff changes quick and there's always something happening. Um, I kind of called it an 80 day meditational retreat because <laughs> it was, <laughs> you know, you just we would wake up and um, go outside and generally we would be skiing pulling our sleds nine to ten hours a day which means we were outside 
with breaks and setting up camp and taking down camp about 12 hours every day. Um, and it's just, it, it's windy. You can't really talk. Your face is completely covered up. You have goggles on. Um, so there's a lot of, even though you're with a team, except for tent time, you're not, there's not a lot of chit chatting and conversations and you're kind of just have a lot of time to yourself staring into the never ending whiteness. I can, I can only imagine. Did did you guys get skinny? Yeah, we did lose a lot of weight. Um, I, you know, it gets to a point where it doesn't matter how much food you bring, you just can't consume as many calories as you're burning. Um, what's what's going on? And what what's the gossip in the polar expeditionary world? You know, there's there's always gossip. The older I get, the more I try to stay out of it and just do my own thing. <laughs> uh, like I think it's the same in any in any sports industry of like when you're young, you care about all these things like records and firsts and I don't know. As I get older, I care less about all that stuff and I just want to do trips that are interesting and special and different um, than other people. And uh, I feel like the polar industry, all the gossip is just like people get all wound up on did this expedition count? Did is that true to style? Did they really? Right, right, okay. I, it, you know, it's, it's the same with the kayaking world. It's like if you do a waterfall but you don't land it, does it count? If you come out of your boat, does it still count as a first ascent? You know, like <laughs> there's all these rules. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I don't know, the older I get, the less I care about the rules. As long as people are honest, you know, just be honest about what you did and whatever. If you had to get a food drop, it's still a cool expedition. It doesn't take anything away from it. Um, right, 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 right. I see people are qualifying. It's a, it's a one up men's thing. Yeah. And which is fine. Like it's, it's, I think it's cool to like have a clean style and, um, have these goals, you know, it's, I think it's awesome if somebody's like, I want to do this trip without any like outside support. Like I'm all for that. And I think it's great. And, um, but sometimes I feel like people are just, doing the same route over and over and over, but just in a slightly different style, you know, like the South pole right now is, is hot. Everybody wants to ski the South pole. And then it'll be like the next year they'll like ski the South pole slightly faster or they'll get to the South pole on a fat bike or like, <laughs> right, you right. Know, like this continue, like everybody's trying to one up each other, but like be, you know, like, yeah. And then ski the South pole, but start like, 50 kilometers further than the person before <laughs> which is great like whatever if that makes people happy that's cool but i'd rather just go do something totally different and somewhere else what's next for you what's on the horizon well that's a really good question um considering this whole coronavirus thing but um Ben and uh, Boomer and I are planning another trip, um, another uh, glacier to river trip. And initially, uh, our plan was to um, to try to access some of the rivers in northern Greenland using kites again. Um, now with the whole coronavirus thing, we've kind of shifted uh, to more local, and we found some cool rivers in Baffin Island that we could cross the ice cap to access them and then uh, paddle down. Um, so we'll see. We've kind of come up with these like <laughs> plan A, B, C, D, depending on what happens. Um, and worst case, if, uh, if we're, if we can't travel, um, boomers found some really cool rivers that are, we could access, from Southern Baffin Island from here, we could hike into um, as like a as a plan C if we are not allowed to travel this summer. What's the status on Baffin Island right now with coronavirus? Um, people are taking it pretty serious. There's a 
all non-essential businesses are shut down. Um, pretty much everybody's transitioned to working at home if they can. Um, and, uh, yeah, social distancing. Our, luckily, our government's been promoting getting outside. Um, so we're free to get outside and play and go camp and dog sled and kite ski, which is awesome. Um, I mean, we've got such a huge... <laughs> a huge space. It's the best way to social distance. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, and not go crazy. But, um, at the moment we have, uh, zero confirmed cases of the virus on the Island and they have pretty much shut down all travel into the territory except for, um, uh, residents and essential workers are allowed to come in but they have to first do a 14 day quarantine before they're allowed to fly up. Oh, wow. Well, yeah. you're, you're in one of the few places that actually has zero cases then. Yeah. Antarctica here also has zero cases. <laughs> <laughs> There's some benefits to living in uh, the middle of nowhere. Before we close down here, Sarah, is there anything else that you would like to add or anything that I've missed that you would uh, want to share with our audience? I think so. We did a good job covering covering a bunch of different things. Well, I am I am going to pick your brain at some point. I want to do a big dog sled trip. Maybe not big in your um, category of big, but I want to do a big dog sled trip at some point. Right. I can't, yeah, you'll I have can't. to come up here and visit. Yeah, that's what I want to do. Um, it's not cheap to get up there. I've definitely looked at it, but it just seems like a super, super cool experience. Yeah, it's a, it's one of my favorite ways to travel, bringing your whole pack of furry friends with you. <laughs> <laughs> where, where can our audience, where can our listeners find out more about you? Are you on Instagram or Facebook, or what's your what's your outlet of choice? Um, yeah, I'm on Instagram. Um, it's uh, just my name, Sarah McNair Landry. All right. Well, I think I'm going to wrap this up, Sarah. It was truly a pleasure. Thank you so much for taking the time to do this. Yeah, thank you. It was uh, great catching up. Have a good one, John. <laughs>